Assalamu alaikum students welcome back to your American literature class this is your ENG 552 and we are coming closer and closer to the end of the semester uh, I hope that this has been a good module for you um, I as a teacher have learned a lot um, and uh, I'm sure you as students will also have learned something um, we base this module on a variety of genres and my attempt throughout has been to give you an introduction to American literature. We have dealt with a number of genres, we've done essays, we've done um, short stories, we even did a chapter out of um, a novel and um, we have done uh, poems. Uh, currently we are doing the play The Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams and um, we have spent a few lectures um, in going through the explanation and the background to the play. So just to quickly recap um, what we have done in this uh, module uh, and particularly in this play, uh, let me um, go back over what we did in the last semester. The Glass Menagerie, essentially speaking, is a memory play and uh, Williams himself has stated in the introductions that because it's a memory play, it doesn't have to be realistic. Um, so there are things that happen which um, are representative of real life and then there are other things that Tennessee Williams brings in um, which go beyond the bounds of um, the real world. One example of this is that um, Tom Wingfield is the narrator of the play and he also plays a role in um, the drama. He's a member of the Wingfield family and um, the point at which um, I left you in the last lecture was where um, Tom Wingfield uh, is having this uh, argument post reconciliation. He has apologized to his mother and his mother is now asking him again where he goes at night and why he goes to the movies so much because Tom Wingfield says I go to the movies I don't go anywhere else. Um, and Amanda uh, Wingfield cannot understand why anyone would want to watch movies all night, every night. So she says, you know, what is it about the movies that attracts you? And um, Tom Wingfield says that I like the sense of adventure. Now that is something that is missing from his life. He's a clerk in a shoe warehouse and um, his life is monotonous, it is dull, there's no excitement in his life. And as he tells his mother, that excitement is what he craves, the excitement of adventure, the excitement of new things happening, and not the same dull, drab routine that he has been doing for years for the sole purpose of earning a living. He'd like to do something really exciting, um, really adventurous. He'd like to go away from house, but he can't do it right now because um, he has to support his mother and his sister. So we had left off at the point where uh, Tom Wing Wingfield says that he would like a, a life of adventure. And uh, we need to see what we have today which supports um, Tom's argument and how Amanda Wingfield tries to make sense out of um, what her son is saying, okay? So Amanda says they do, they do or they do without it. Young men, all young men don't go for adventure. Not everybody has a craze for adventure. These are the exact words that she uses. And um, Tom says man is by instinct a lover, a hunter, a fighter. And none of these instincts are given much play at the warehouse. So for him, man has four roles, that of a lover, a hunter, uh, sorry, three roles, that of a lover, a hunter, and a fighter. And he says, none of these can I put into play um, at my place of work. There's no excitement, um, there's no romance, there's no adventure. 
so um, I cannot do any of um, these and Amanda says man is by instinct she catches uh, hold of um, this phrase man is by instinct and um, she elaborates on uh, on that and she says don't quote instinct to me instinct is something that people have got away from it belongs to animals Christian adults don't want it and um, Tom says what do Christian adults want uh, so what what they are now quarreling about is why Tom goes to the movies so much you remember previously they had had an argument and um, Tom had said that uh, if Amanda chooses not to believe that Tom goes to the movies then she can believe whatever she wants to then he doesn't care uh, but here because there's just been a reconciliation Tom has apologized to his mother for his rude behavior and um, so they're they're having uh, a discussion but because Amanda's ideas are so very different from those of Tom it soon turns into an argument out of the discussion arises the argument out of the argument arises the quarrel so what you see is that there's a distinct difference in um, what Amanda thinks is right and should be done and what Tom considers um, that he should do with his life so when Tom says that um, I want adventure Amanda says that you're talking about instincts human beings are something more than ins instinctive creatures human beings do not go by instincts it's only animals who follow instincts human beings have been given the ability to think to rationalize to plan and so human beings want superior things instincts are for the animals and Tom says I reckon they're not and Amanda says you're joking however that isn't what I wanted to discuss and Tom at this point says you know I don't have much time and Amanda says you have to listen to what I have to say now Tom is getting impatient because it is um, getting uh, very close to the time that he's supposed to report for work and uh, as he says you don't want me to punch in red at the warehouse because that would mean that he's uh, coming late and that would further mean a deduction in his salary and so Amanda says you know now that I want to talk to you you say that you are getting late but uh, you have to give me five minutes of your time and that is all that I require of you and what I want to talk to you about is Laura your sister here um, you have the legend of plans and provisions and the conversation from this point onwards uh, focuses on plans and provisions so um, Tom you know sort of resigns himself and says all right what about Laura and Amanda says we have to be making some plans and provisions for her so here is where the legend comes in plans and provisions she's older than you uh, and of course Laura is two years older um, to Tom so what concerns Amanda is that Laura seems to be drifting along she doesn't appear to have an aim in life um, she doesn't want professional training she doesn't want to take up a job uh, and she says that she can't get married because she's a cripple so they have to do something Amanda is sincerely worried about Laura uh, but even more than that she's worried about keeping up appearances so she keeps on trying to uh, think of ways in which she can save money in which she can make money so when she comes out with this um, Tom says I guess she's the type that people call home girls and Amanda says there's no such type uh, and if there is it's a pity unless the home is hers that is her husband's so Amanda Wingfield has only two options for Laura she can either get married or she can do a job she cannot do both she cannot sit with neither 
So um, she chalks out this plan and she says we have to think of something for her um, because um, there is no woman who has a home which is not her husband's. And um, Tom uh, differs from her opinion, differs from her viewpoint, but Amanda is, you know, very, very obstinate. And she says, I can see the handwriting on the wall as plain as I see the nose in front of my face. Uh, and um, what she is pointing out to is the fact that Tom wants to run away. Um, she says, more and more you remind me of your father. He was out all hours without explanation. So you see that in the second generation, the same thing is being repeated um, with the difference that uh, as far as Tom Wingfield is concerned, his mother is around to question him and his mother asks him all kinds of questions and she objects to his um, staying out uh, late at night and she says you know I have seen the letter that you got from the merchant marine I know what you're dreaming of but um, she says um, you cannot do that until you see Laura settle down and that is Laura married not settle down with her mother but as a married woman uh, and Tom pretends not to understand and, uh, and Amanda says, you know, we have to make some plan for her. We have, we have to decide who she is to marry since she will not go out. She will not make the decision for herself. Um, and so she says that as soon as um, Laura has somebody to take care of her, um, he, that is Tom, can go away. He can join the Marines. He can join the Merchant Navy. But until that time, he has to stay here and take care of Laura and Amanda both. For herself, she says, once Laura gets married, you don't have to worry about me. Because all my troubles will be over. Uh, this is only uh, until Laura gets married and is settled within her own house uh, and with her husband. But until that thing happens, he has to look out uh, for his sister. He has to look after his sister. She is young and um, she is dependent. Amanda uh, does not consider herself um, young anymore. And she says, it doesn't matter about me. I can go anywhere. I have a lot of options. Um, and uh, it is for Laura that um, I want you. Um, to think and to plan. All she does is fool with those pieces of glass and play those worn out records. So here, you know, Amanda is, is very bitter. Um, she's also unhappy because uh, um, Laura Wingfield doesn't seem to have any, um, any occupation other than cleaning and polishing those glass animals or playing records on, uh, on the Victrola. And Tom is totally bewildered and he says, what can I do about it? If Laura doesn't go out, if Laura can't find a man to marry her, if she doesn't attend the business school, how can I help? What do I have to do? And uh, Amanda says, be less selfish. According to her, um, selfishness is associated with wanting something for yourself. So as far as she sees um, Tom Wingfield's desire to go out uh, on a ship is selfish. So she says, um, you know, you have to think about somebody else. You keep on thinking of yourself. So according to her, Tom is selfish. Now this um, statement that she makes, make makes Tom really angry. Um, he gets up and he starts to dress for work. Um, and even here, Amanda will not let him be. Uh, and when she sees the way he's dressed, she says, where is your muscle, muffler? Put your wool muffler on. And Tom is angry because he's being treated like a little baby. And um, he just wants to leave this place. He wants to get out of the house. Um, he wants to go away from his mother's presence because he's really and truly angry now that he has been dubbed as being um, selfish. 
and um, Tom, uh, um, Amanda says that, you know, I haven't uh, told you what I have in mind. And Tom says, you know, it's too late because um, I have to be at work and uh, I'm already running late. So Amanda catches hold of his arm and she says, um, down at the warehouse, aren't there some nice young men? And Tom says, no. Amanda refuses to believe that and she says there must be some and I want you to find out some uh, clean living man who doesn't drink and ask him out for your sister. So in other words what she is saying is bring such a person home so that we can call him a gentleman caller, we can make preparation for him and he can see Laura Wingfield in her home ground um, uh, as, as best as um, he can. Uh, so he, you know, he is totally incensed and he says, oh my gosh. And Amanda doesn't let go and she says, will you, will you, will you dear? So she keeps on at him until he says yes you know, out of sheer frustration because she continues with the same question. Uh, will you ask someone? Will you look out for someone? Will you bring someone home? And when he cannot take any more, he just says yes and he um, leaves. Amanda closes the door and the image that is, screen, uh, that is seen on the screen now again is that of a Glamour magazine uh, cover. And Amanda is seen on the phone and she is talking to Ella Cartwright. She identifies herself and she says, how are you honey? Uh, how is that kidney condition? And then there is a wait of five seconds during which presumably um, the other person um, is speaking. And then again she says horrors and then she repeats something that she has said to somebody else earlier and she says you know you are a Christian martyr. Yes honey that's what you are a Christian martyr. When she finds out that what um, Ella Cartwright is doing um, she is full of praise. Now mind you her sole purpose is to sell subscriptions to, um, to the journal and she tries to trap people into committing that they will um, subscribe to the journal and she gets a tiny amount uh, out of those subscriptions that she brings in. So in order to convince Ella Cartwright she goes through the whole story uh, of uh, how they have this new writer and she has, um, she, she has written um, on uh, American Indian uh, literature and um, you know this is something that uh, that they are publishing in the journal. Um, the, the writer's name is Bessie May Hopper and she tries to trap Ella Cartwright into saying that you know Bessie May Hopper's new serial is included uh, in the journal and you wouldn't want to miss that so um, uh, you know you need to renew your subscription so she tries every which way in order to trap Ella Cartwright and at this scene where she's still talking to Ella Cartwright um, there is a fade out and the next scene starts with the legend of Annunciation and of course there's music in the background. Uh, the scene is described as being different now. It is early dusk on a spring evening. Supper has just been finished in the Wingfield apartment. Amanda and Laura are in light colored dresses and they are clearing um, the table in the upstage area which is shadowy. So their movements uh, come as very um, soft and slow movements almost as if they're performing a dance because you see them through the curtains you don't see um, the figures of Amanda and uh, Laura as a whole you see them only as um, shadows now while uh, this is being shown you see uh, Tom, 
rising from the table and moving towards the fire escape which is of course the entrance and um, the exit to the uh, apartment and Amanda says uh, son will you do me a favor and Tom says what now, you know she, she, all the time she's at him do this don't do that uh, why are you doing this why aren't you doing the other so Tom gets very very tense and he's very frustrated in her presence so when uh, he just passes by Amanda she says will you do me a favor and he says what is it now and Amanda says comb your hair you look so pretty when your hair is combed now that's not an adjective that you normally um, use for a man you use something like handsome perhaps uh, or gorgeous uh, but um, she says you look so pretty with your hair combed and of course um, Tom doesn't sit upright Tom slouches on the sofa uh, and uh, Amanda continues with her harangue and she says um, there's only one respect in which I would like you to emulate your father and that is the care he always took of his appearance so she doesn't um, think well of her husband she doesn't appreciate anything that he's done but one thing and that is that he always took care of his appearance he always looked smart um, and um, nicely dressed so now she recalls that and uh, and she says you know he never allowed himself to look untidy and that is what you should also be focusing on um, so during this conversation Tom gets up to go and Amanda says where are you going so you see all the time she is at him what are you doing where are you going when are you going to do this when are you going to do the other why aren't you doing it in this way and Tom gets sickened by her very presence so when she says where are you going he says um, I'm going out to smoke and so then Amanda takes this thing up and she says you smoke too much a pack a day at 15 cents a pack and then she calculates and she says you know you smoke so many packs and uh, how much uh, does that come to in a month and um, what, what she's actually heading for is how can they save the money that he is spending on cigarettes and use it in a different manner so she's, she does quick calculation and um, decides that you know they can save money and then she says um, you know this if you save uh, what you are smoking in one month um, you could be spending this as fee for a night school uh, at the Washington University and um, so what she's trying to do is encourage him to study and to improve his education and therefore his uh, job category um, so she says you know it would be such a wonderful thing if you were to continue your education and spend what you're smoking on a fee for a night school you could really get ahead in life uh, but this doesn't impress Tom at all and he says I'd rather smoke so it, he has been driven to a point where he doesn't even want to listen to what his mother has to say and when she says don't smoke too much um, he becomes very angry uh, but he is civil throughout you know he doesn't um, he, he does he's not outright rude like he was the first time this time he realizes that um, he has to stay within his limits so even when she says that um, you shouldn't smoke um, he says uh, I don't want to go to night school I would rather smoke so um, that makes Amanda very angry and she says you know that's that is the problem and she looks at her husband's picture as if to say um, that whatever you did your son is doing now so she is blaming him um, for what Tom is doing she doesn't take any of the responsibility on herself she doesn't once consider that she might be to blame for her son staying out um, so late at night there is music uh, and uh, the legend says all the world is waiting for the sunrise so this is the music that is playing 
and this is where Tom comes in as a narrator, not as an actor, but as a narrator again. And what he's narrating is where he goes when he leaves home. And he says, across the alley from us was the paradise dance hall. On evenings in spring, the windows and doors were open and the music came outdoors. Sometimes the lights were turned out except for a large glass sphere that hung from the ceiling. So like a chandelier, that was all that was left turned on. It would turn slowly about and filter the dusk with delicate rainbow colors. So a huge disco light kind of thing where you have different colored lights uh, coming out. Then the orchestra played a waltz or a tango, something that had a slow and sensuous rhythm. Couples would come outside to the relative privacy of the alley. You could see them kissing behind ash pits and telegraph poles. This was the compensation for lives that passed like mine without any change or adventure. Adventure and change were imminent in this year. They were waiting around the corner for all these kids. Suspended in the midst over Burke's garden, caught in the folds of Chamberlain's umbrella, in Spain there was Gurnica. Okay, let's go back. So Tom is here as narrator and what he points out to is something that we don't see uh, on the stage. So in other words, he is describing something that is outside the bounds of the stage. And um, he says that uh, there, there was uh, a dance hall across from our apartment building. And in this dance hall, people would um, pay to dance because um, this was the only place where the lower middle class people could come and imagine to themselves that they were a part of high society. So dance is something that is not limited to those who belong to the upper classes. It's something that everyone wants to do. And so he says, um, people like me, who were sick of um, leading routine, dull, drab lives, they would come here, they would um, listen to the music, and they would dance to the music because this happened to be the only form of entertainment that was provided for people coming from um, the lower middle classes. And at such uh, evenings, uh, William says that um, the orchestra would play soft music so that people could dance and they could also um, enjoy the music. Now, uh, in the background of what is happening here, uh, Tom says, in Spain there was Gurnica. Now, this, of course, is uh, a reference, not just to Picasso's painting, that is Gurnica, uh, but also to events in Europe. Because you know that Picasso and others like him were very moved by the violence uh, and the tyranny of the um, oppressors in Europe. And so it is through their art, through um, their creative work, that they express their dissatisfaction with the present state of things. So um, he says at the same time that uh, people um, in, in my vicinity were leading dull, drab, routine lives, there were people who were not only enjoying their life, but who were coming up with great works of art, uh, like uh, Picasso's Gurnica. When he painted that, it was a marvelous um, picture, a marvelous painting, and it received a lot of acclaim, it received a lot of praise. So while 
their routines, uh, routine lives are dull and drab. There are people who are making a contribution to art. They are making a contribution um, to literature. Uh, but here there was only music and liquor, dance halls, um, ban and movies and sex. So all these things pervade the society of the time and um, do not allow um, the creative side to come into the forefront. So what um, Tom as narrator is saying is that a lot of this has to do with the social cultural um, environment that uh, people encounter because there was a lot of encouragement for um, for art in uh, within Europe um, he says here in the United States nothing creative was being done so according to to Tom um, in the United States, nothing much was happening. In Europe, there were uh, clouds of war, clouds of war that threatened the peace in Europe. But the United States was very, very complacent because nothing was happening within the U.S. Um, everything that was happening was in Europe and therefore America did not concern itself with them. Now what Will Williams is calling attention to here is also the insularity of the Americans, um, their indifference to what is happening in um, the rest of the world, uh, which Williams says was waiting for bomb bombardments. Now um, this is um, the part that he um, gives us of Tom as narrator. Um, soon after this, uh, Tom appears as an actor or as a character uh, in, within the play. Uh, we see Amanda looking uh, outside uh, and seeing the moon and she says, uh, a fire escape landing is a poor excuse for a porch. So ideally speaking, she would have a house, she would have a porch, and um, she would feel very proud of uh, her possessions. But this apartment is at the back of the building. It's in the lower middle class um, area. There are no car porches. The only thing that they have is um, the fire escape landing, which um, serves to um, which, which serves as an entry point into the Wingfield apartment. And uh, Amanda looks at uh, Tom Wingfield and she says, uh, what are you looking at? And he says, the moon. And Amanda says, is there a moon this evening? And Tom says, it's rising over Garfinkel's delicatessen. So what he is talking about is places other than home. Um, and when Amanda looks carefully, she says, yes, it is a little silver slipper of a moon. And um, tradition dictates that when you see the crescent or when you see this tiny um, silver slipper of a moon, uh, the new moon, uh, you need to make a wish. And generally, whatever wish um, you make um, is granted. So uh, she says, you know, it's, it's a tiny moon, it's a new moon. Uh, have you made a wish? And Tom has not thought about that. So um, he does uh, quickly and silently. And uh, when he's done that, Amanda wants to know what he wished for. And Tom says, that's a secret. Now you see, that is how overbearing she can get. She wants to get everything out of Tom, all the information, all um, the all, all the friends that um, he has. And uh, when he says that it's a secret what I wished for, Amanda says, a secret, huh? Well, I won't tell mine either. I will be just as mysterious as you. And uh, Tom says, I bet I can guess what your desire is. And Amanda is slightly offended and she says, is my head so transparent? And Tom counters that and says, you're not a sphinx. You know, traditionally the sphinx is the monster um, that guards um, 
Gaza and um, I, I'm sorry, it, the, the, the Sphinx guards the, the, the city of Giza and uh, when Tom makes a reference to the Sphinx, uh, what he's actually saying is that the Sphinx could keep secrets. His mother cannot. Whatever his mother knows, she goes and blabs to the entire community. So um, she cannot really keep a secret. She cannot keep confidences. And Amanda says, well, I don't have any secrets. I'll tell you what I wished for the moon. Now, previously she has said, I will not tell you my wish either. Uh, and Tom is okay with it because he says, oh, you know, I, I know what you would uh, wish for. So Amanda says, well, you don't know anything about me. You don't know what I wished. I wished for success and happiness for my precious children. I wish for that whenever there's a moon and when there isn't a moon, I wish it too. So um, she says that she is all the time preoccupied with, um, with ideas about her children leading successful lives. No matter what field they choose to, they have to be um, successful because then that reflects on um, Amanda Wingfield also. So um, when, um, whenever she thinks of a son, uh, she sends him uh, a wish. And Tom says, I thought perhaps you had wished a gentleman caller. And that sort of puts her on that stage again. And she says, why do you say that? And, Amanda, uh, and Tom says, don't you remember asking me to fetch one? And Amanda says, I remember suggesting that it would be nice for your sister if you brought home some nice young man. And... Um, Tom is like, you know, this is something that is beyond me. Uh, and um, Amanda, uh, it, Amanda's mind is a single track. And she reiterates her earlier wish um, that Tom would bring some of his young colleagues over to the house for a cup of tea um, so that Laura can appear eligible and um, some young man would propose and would ultimately marry her. Um, the only difference is that this time when Amanda and Tom have this conversation, it takes a different twist. And um, Tom says, we're going to have one. And Amanda says, what? And Tom says, a gentleman caller. Now, this gets uh, Amanda all excited up. And of course, um, she rises from the table. The legend on the screen says, the Annunciation is celebrated with music. Um, the image that follows this, uh, the one with Annunciation, the image that follows is that of a gentleman caller uh, with a bouquet of flowers. And Amanda is totally surprised by this announcement that her son makes. And she says, you mean to say that you've asked some nice young man to come over to the house? And Tom says, yep, I've asked him to dinner. And Amanda says, you really did? She can't believe that he can be that good. You know, all along they have been quarreling because their ideas don't match. Uh, but um, at this point in time, Amanda feels that he has done something truly wonderful by uh, asking someone um, to come and... Um, to ultimately propose for his sister's uh, hand. Uh, and so Amanda is excited and yet she's a little afraid also. And she says, did he accept the invitation? And Tom replies in the affirmative. So then, you know, Amanda gears up uh, and starts making preparation 
for for dinner already and uh, she she says you know that's lovely um, and uh, and then she wants to confirmation and she says is this definite uh, and when is it going to be and Tom says soon very soon that is very soon um, they are going to have a gentleman caller and perhaps the entire issue of Laura Wingfield will be resolved uh, but uh, Amanda is not satisfied with the simple yes coming from um, Tom she wants something more she wants details uh, because now she has to plan for uh, for a dinner and Tom says what things do you want me to tell um, about him and Amanda says you know naturally I'd like to know when he's coming and when she's told that he's um, coming on the next day she is doubly excited because there's very little time and um, already uh, according to Amanda Wingfield um, they have uh, wasted time so um, she quickly starts making preparations and she says why didn't you phone me at once as soon as you asked him the minute that he accepted um, then uh, don't you see I could have been getting ready so she puts the cart before the horse before um, bef long before uh, when Amanda came up with this idea she did not share it at once with uh, with everyone so uh, in other words what he uh, what Amanda is saying is that I have a lot to prepare and I would have saved time if you had called me from the office and told me that this is what uh, you are planning um, to work on and uh, when Tom says oh mother don't have don't, don't make a fuss uh, Amanda is incensed and um, she says uh, Tom of course I have to make a fuss I want things nice not sloppy not thrown together I'll certainly have to do some fast thinking now um, now uh, Amanda at once gets excited and she says you know we have to make preparations we have to think and Tom says I don't see why you have to think at all you don't have to make a fuss and um, Amanda says what are you talking about you don't know uh, how these things are done we can't have a gentleman caller in a pigsty and all of a sudden you know she starts uh, getting very excited and she gets concerned about um, the apartment and that the apartment doesn't look nice enough um, so she says there's a lot of work that needs to be done all my wedding silver has to be polished the monogrammed table linen ought to be laundered that is washed and ironed the windows have to be washed and fresh curtains put up and how about clothes we have to wear something don't we and Tom is totally flabbergasted and he says mother this boy is no one to make a fuss over you know he's just um, a colleague in a warehouse he's not um, he's not a prince coming to um, propose to his sister so uh, but this is where their um, ideas are totally different and uh, Amanda um, gets thoroughly excited at the thought that they're going to have they're finally going to have a gentleman caller for uh, Laura but Tom is not excited at all and he says you know so fine he's, he's just a boy he's just a young man that I'm calling over um, and uh, you don't need to get excited but Amanda says you know there's so much to be done there's clothes to be washed and we have to have nice clothes to wear uh, and uh, the the good cutlery needs to be taken out things that you know a, a housewife uh, would think about if she had guests coming in and perhaps you yourself have seen um, in within your own house how when guests are coming we bring out the best of everything we bring out the best crockery and cutlery um, we bring out the best bed sheets we polish we clean we sweep um, we, we do everything we can to present our 
accommodation or our residence, our house in the best proper light. But this is something that Tom um, just doesn't understand. Uh, and um, he says, you know, it's not such a big deal. But um, for Amanda, it's a very big deal because, um, as she says, do you realize he's the first young man we've introduced to your sister? So officially, this is going to be the first gentleman caller. Uh, it's terrible, dreadful, disgraceful that poor little sister has never received a single gentleman caller. And then she calls Tom inside and she says, we need to discuss these things and we need to think of what, uh, what we're going to do and how we are going to do it. And Tom is like, what do you want to do? Um, so Amanda says, I want to ask you some things. Now that we're going to have a gentleman caller, I want to know what he's like. So Tom says, if you're going to make such a fuss, I'll call it off. I'll tell him not to come. Because, you know, for him, um, it's a very strange situation. Um, he is bringing home a colleague. And he doesn't want to give his colleague the idea that this is going to be a very important visit. He's just inviting him over. But for Amanda, this is a godsend opportunity. So she says, no, 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 no. We need to discuss certain things. And you will not tell your friend not to come. Um, you will bring him home and we will treat him to a very good dinner. Nothing offends people worse than broken engagements. It simply means I'll have to work like a Turk. In other words, he, she will have to work like a slave. The reference to Turks is the reference to um, slaves being brought in during, um, du during the Crusades. And she says that we, we are going to present everything very nicely. We won't be brilliant but we will pass inspection. And she says this because she realizes that the apartment is in a low middle class neighborhood. They don't have any money um, with which to furnish the apartment. And so you ha they have only the basics of uh, furniture. Uh, but she sort of drags him inside and she says, come in and sit down and I need to ask you um, certain things. And Tom is a little sarcastic when she says, sit down and, and he says, uh, is there any particular place you would like me to sit? That is, um, you know, now that she's sort of getting all geared up for, um, for, for the dinner. Uh, Tom feels that maybe uh, he has to change his habits also um, just because a colleague is coming. And Amanda says, thank heavens I've got that new sofa. I'm also making uh, payments on a floor lamp I'll have sent out. So you know, she, she's trying her best to make ends meet. She scrimps and she saves. Um, she begs and she pleads people. But she's doing it for her children she's doing it in order to give them a better life than um, than she has had so um, she wants everything for her children that she has not had um, and so she says that i have this new sofa and i'm making payments on a floor lamp and i'll tell them to to send the floor lamp in advance and i'll continue paying the installments and put the chintz covers on. So she's making preparations on how she can uh, make the house into not only a home, but in, into also a very beautiful place. And in the middle of um, all those preparations, she says, what is the man's name? And uh, Tom says his name is O'Connor. And <clears throat> just because he gives that name, um, Amanda has other thoughts and she says that of course means fish tomorrow's Friday. So she has, um, she has a whole host of ideas that come into her mind and which she's following at the same time. So she's multitasking very much uh, a contemporary woman. She's doing many things at the same time. She's thinking of the crockery. She's thinking of what clothes um, Laura and uh, her mother are going to wear. Um, she's thinking of 
um, the, the crockery and cutlery that needs to be taken out and washed, etc., etc. And then in the middle of everything, you know, she says, she thinks that she doesn't even know his name. So she asks him, but she doesn't pay attention to uh, Tom's response because she's so busy thinking of what she's going to cook. Um, so she says it's going to be Friday. Uh, and therefore they will not be able to get any meat Friday being the day off for uh, butchers at that time so she says we'll have to get fish but I'm going to get a salmon loaf um, and I'm going to put on um, the appropriate um, dressing and uh, that should be very nice like she says before uh, it won't be brilliant but it will pass inspection and now when she's thinking of um, of the food at once uh, another thought comes to her and uh, she says what does he do uh, he works at the warehouse and Tom says of course how else would and she says he he doesn't drink and Tom says why do you ask me that and Amanda says your father did so whatever um, Tom and Laura's father did is not to be done Amanda will not have another such person already the presence of um, her husband is very strong because you have this portrait that seems to be um, looking down upon uh, whoever is uh, assembled there so when when he when she asks um, if he drinks um, Tom says what difference does that make um, and 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 don't get started on that and Amanda says he does drink then and Tom says not that I know of so you know she comes up with so many different questions because there's a lot of confusion in her mind and that confusion is a result of the excitement that she's feeling because finally somebody is coming over although the man doesn't know what he's coming for the fact that Tom has invited him to dinner uh, gets Amanda all worked up and she says I have to do this and I have to do that and I have to do a zillion other things um, and, um, and and you need to make sure that he doesn't drink you know you can't just say he doesn't drink and have him coming to our house and uh, complaining that um, we are not serving drinks so he says I don't think so now when he says I don't think so Amanda at once pounces on him and she says you've got to make sure you've got to ask I the last thing I want for my daughter's daughter is a boy who drinks so that's not what she wants uh, for her daughter because she has spent her whole life um, suffering from uh, the after effects of marrying a boy who drank so she will not have a son-in-law who drinks and Tom says aren't you being a little bit uh, premature Mr. O'Connor has not appeared on the scene as yet so this gives us a little um, sort of um, inkling of what is to come Tom has just invited him for dinner he has said nothing about his sister he's not said anything about um, his mother what he has done is he's invited uh, Jim O'Connor home without thinking of anything else so uh, when she starts making preparations um, Tom says you know you're being a bit premature at this stage you don't need to make a big fuss it's only if something emerges out of this visit uh, then and then only can you start making mental preparations so she gets all excited she starts making preparations and Tom says you being premature because um, he hasn't even come you don't even know what he looks like we don't even know whether um, Laura and Jim O'Connor are going to strike it off uh, O'Connor has absolutely no idea that he's going as a gentleman caller all that he knows is that a colleague of his has invited him to dinner 
so when uh, Tom says he hasn't even appeared on the scene as yet, Amanda says, but he will tomorrow to meet your sister. And what do I know about his character? Nothing. Old maids are better off than wives of drunkards. Now you see how she's jumping to conclusions. He has not even appeared on the scene and already she's thinking about uh, Jim O'Connor being married to Laura Wingfield. So she says, you know, uh, old maids uh, dying uh, unmarried, dying a spinster is better than being um, the wife of a drunkard. But that she's saying now that there is someone coming in. Um, as long as... Uh, Laura remained without a single gentleman caller. She was desperate to get somebody and now that she has someone who is coming in, um, she wants to make uh, full preparation and she says, you know, we can't have um, Mr. O'Connor marrying Laura if he drinks. And Tom says, Lots of fellows meet girls whom they don't marry. Now what he's trying to say here is that Mrs. Wingfield should not depend too much on this one person who is coming in. She shouldn't take the idea so seriously that she starts planning a wedding. Um, and um, and. Amanda, of course, will not be stopped. Amanda is so full of enthusiasm and excitement um, that no matter what um, her son says, she is not willing to consider that this man is not coming for uh, Laura's hand in marriage. We are going to stop here. I am going to recap what we've done today. Uh, and then in the next lecture, we will go on from um, here onwards. Um, so um, th what we did today uh, starts off at a point in time when Tom has just had a reconciliation with his mother. And um, he, um, he he's trying to... Um, talk with his mother in a sensible, sane manner, but he realizes that that is very, very difficult because he says one thing and his mother jumps to conclusions um, and um, in fact will not even let him breathe properly. She's at him all the time, do this, don't do that, uh, why are you doing this and why aren't you doing um, the other? So um, she has a very hard time controlling uh, herself because she sees Tom. Um, it sort of provides her with, uh, with, with a vent for her feelings. Like, uh, it has a cathartic effect and so she brings in all the ideas in her mind. And, um, and, and one of these uh, comes out when she sees um, Tom preparing to go out and, um, he sh and, and she asks him where he's going. Um, he says, I'm going out to smoke. So then she picks up that point and she uh, gives him a long lecture on that and she says, you know, you smoke so many packs of cigarettes and if you divide that or multiply that by such and such a figure, uh, you would be, you, you would realize how much money you're spending on smoking. And so then you would start saving that money and maybe enroll yourself in a night school so that you have uh, your academic qualification increases and um, we, can, um, we can go for, uh, for, for better job opportunities. So um, the moment that um, Tom mentions that he is bringing in a colleague of his um, home for dinner, Amanda jumps up, she's excited, she is um, at, she's tense, 
but that excitement overrules everything and she starts asking him very detailed questions which um, Tom is not willing to answer because he says you know it's just a friend or it's just a colleague who's coming to dinner all I did was invite him to dinner I've not told him that I have a sister um, and that I want you to marry my sister I am doing uh, the maximum that I can do and that is bringing him home do not ask me to do anything else but Amanda doesn't take him seriously at all she becomes very excited and she starts planning how she's going to reorganize her household and um, what they're having for dinner in spite of the fact that um, she cannot really uh, afford to make any drastic changes within the household she doesn't have any money at all except what Tom gives her periodically but um, because this is the first time that any young man is coming to the house Amanda um, takes it for granted that um, that the man is coming to propose to Laura and that they will accept so she works on that basic premise and it is with this in mind that um, she questions Tom about his name about um, his job description uh, whether he is uh, whether he drinks or not and Tom says I don't know all these things I don't think he drinks but I don't know for sure and Amanda says find out for sure uh, Tom says that this is just a colleague who is um, coming home because I called him for dinner you do not attach so much importance to one individual he may not want to marry Laura Laura may not want to marry um, Jim O'Connor but in Amanda's dictionary in Amanda's mind this is as good as settled this is as good as Jim O'Connor marrying Amanda Wakefield and so she um, she bases her arguments on that um, on that premise she wants to know what he does um, what his name is where he comes from and I'm sure she asks him a whole lot of other questions that Williams has not uh, put down here so when Tom sees that his mother is very excited and there's no way that she's going to um, listen to what he is saying he says uh, um, he says we haven't even seen that uh, mr. O'Connor you don't know what he looks like you don't know how he talks um, and we can't get uh, we, we cannot get um, let's say Laura married off at gunpoint we have to wait and see what mr. O'Connor is like uh, what taste he has how far we compliment um, his taste and uh, that's about it there, there are dozens of uh, if not hundreds um, there are dozens of um, men who see, who meet girls who see girls but they don't want to marry her so what he is trying to say in effect is that Amanda should not get over excited at this Amanda needs to keep her excitement within bounds they don't want um, Jim O'Connor to know what they have in their mind if he fits in with this uh, with, with this household then yes it would be a very good thing but that is something that um, that that Tom uh, cannot imagine all that he can imagine is what is actually going to happen and what is actually going to happen is Jim O'Connor is coming to dinner because Tom Wingfield invited him Jim O'Connor is not trying to um, impose something um, but he is taken to be a man who is ready to marry 
Laura Wingfield and there is nothing that Tom can do to get that idea out of um, his mother's head. We'll stop here and continue in the next class. Thank you very much and Allah Hafiz.